Thank you so much, Vikram, and thank you to the organizers for inviting us to join you. Um, and thank you, Bana, your presentation was excellent. So hopefully I have something to add. Um, but I think I just want to talk a bit about some of the points that Bana raised, maybe uh, add some things. And also this is relating to a lot of the points that um, Louis brought up as well. So um, as Bana mentioned, you know, this piece is really the piece that we wrote, anti-Zionism as decolonization, is really something that we've thought about writing for such a long time. And in the days following October 7th, it became really obvious that there wasn't any, there wasn't any more time not to be explicitly talking about what is anti-Zionism? How do Palestinians understand it? How do we put it in a historical context? And how do we imagine it going forward? Because it can't be a slogan and it can't be a way of, you know, garnering donations. It really has to mean something when we're talking about liberation and decolonization. So one of the, um, so I'll talk a little bit about the settler native relationship as we discuss it. Um, and then the two other sections in our article about structural changes to support liberation and bold solidarity, which Banna brought up and already discussed a bit. So um, I think one of the most important pieces of our of our article, which maybe, you know, this is obvious to folks, but I think it's important to be said, um, is the relationship between the settler and the native and the native. And in general and in the unique discourse surrounding Palestine. So as we put it, these are two distinct classes um, which indicate relationships to power, privileges, and resources within the Zionist settler colonial systems and institutions. And this is important because all Israelis are settlers and all of their privileges, power, and resources come at the direct expense of Palestinians. And this is really important because we talk more, and I'll talk more in a second, about international law, international institutions, and their uses, um, and the way that they really divide settlers, Israeli settlers, in the context of Palestine into good and bad, acceptable, unacceptable, and legitimize aspects of Zionism. Um, but also since October 7th, we've seen how these class lines, and Louis talked a bit about this already, how they're illuminated not only within settle, Israeli settler society, as we've seen Israelis across the political spectrum coming together to enact genocide, very little public resistance. Public resistance until very recently has been centered on you know, what is str politically strategic for Israelis, their captives, things like that, and not about Palestinians, our right to resistance, our right to liberation or anything like that. But we've also seen the way these class lines ha exist beyond the geographic space of Palestine. So in the global North and South, and especially in organizations and institutions in the global North. And as Bikram said, I'm Palestinian American, so my context is the US. So that's you know what I'll relate to here. But we've seen how these a lot of these institutions and organizations fought, have fallen in line. And really, even those that purport to advocate for Palestinians use rhetoric that supports settler narratives. So we've seen things like, outright condemnation of October 7th, um, centering Israeli deaths as above or, you know, in the same context as Palestinian deaths, calling for ceasefire, as Bana discussed already, without any qualification explanation of what that means, um, entertaining the analysis of terrorism or Israeli self-defense, and also in omissions, like not talking about Israeli Zionism and settler colonialism. And we also have seen today alone how this relationship between the settler and the indigenous and the, the resources and the rights and the privileges of the settler coming directly as a result of this theft is still playing out in very dramatic, very real ways. So today we saw, today or, or yesterday, um, 
the decision of nine countries to suspend their financial support for UNRWA. And of course, we can talk about critiques of UNRWA, but we know that you know, it was established and provides some of the resources stolen from Palestinians in lieu of their right to return and our access to, you know, our resources in Palestine. Um, so there's a clip that went viral today by Israeli official Noga Arbel, who said in the Knesset on January 4th, it will be, quote, it will be impossible to win this war if we do not destroy UNRWA. She relates to this through the continuation of Palestinians' refugee status, which is protected by UNRWA. And she also tweeted again today to reinforce this idea that the right of return is what makes UNRWA genocidal. So she's making it really clear, right? And it's and it's becoming increasingly clear and no longer shrouded in any uh, discourse, in any liberal discourse. Settler colonialism can only survive as long as the violent theft of resources from the native population continues and is protected. And so, you know, in a context where Israel hasn't achieved any of its stated goals in this genocide, this is also an illuminating, illuminating statement and act showing, you know, it's not about targeting UNRWA for any affiliation with resistance organizations, but really for the resources that it provides Palestinians, both the material resources to sustaining livelihood, but also the legal ones that sustain refugeehood and you know, the possibility of return. And this is just one of the ways that we see settlers um, explicitly acknowledging the threat of Palestinians' you know, legal status and access to resources that allow us to remain in our lands. Um, I'll turn quick, I know my time is running. I'll turn, I just wanna talk a bit about structural changes to support liberation, which is one of our sections in our article as well and, and an important piece. Banna touched on this already, but um, you know, we can see through the limited scope of the ICJ decision, the, the failure of the ICC to act, the ability of the US and its imperial allies to disrupt international consensus in the UN and other uh, acts that the existing mechanisms and, and law did not serve Palestinian Palestinians or our liberation. So, you know, Abana talked about this, but, you know, clinging to international law as our primary mode of analysis or human rights or the framework of military occupation starting in 1967 is not only unstrategic, but it's also a, a denial of the basic truths of Palestinian history, the struggle for liberation, and the moment that we're in right now. And we see that for too long, allies have set aside what is right, what is truthful, what Palestinians envision for ourselves, for what is politically expedient in the moment. And this comes at the expense of one group, Palestinians. And this is also important because as we've seen play out across our screens, not only you know, since October 7th, but long before, Palestinians are often asked to record the most tragic moments of our lives through videos, through interviews, you know, for solidarity organizations to send out um, for their fundraising campaigns. But we are denied the ability until this moment to politically narrate our history and talk about the future that we imagine for ourselves. And we're encouraged not only by the limited granting of resources, but also the withholding of resources on this basis to acknowledge and legitimize settler colonialism and Zionism often through, you know, talking about the occupation framework starting 1967, international humanitarian uh, law, human rights, and things like that. So in our article and in general, we talk about bold solidarity as what Palestinians deserve. And Bana and I are both members of the Good Shepherd Collective. GSC has offered creative ways to interact with existing legal structures um, locally and internationally, locally, sorry, in the in the US, not in Palestine, which puts the power back in the hands of people rather than maintaining it in these structures through the defund racism campaign. But also now um, we have been asking folks to leverage their their resources, donations and votes to pressure 
politicians into calling for an end to this genocide, as well as the 17 year siege on Gaza and move towards decolonization. Um, but I think this moment really demands that we think more broadly and more creatively and other, and I think Louis has already brought this up and Banna did, about how we build a new world, build a different world and no longer rely on these old tactics or the NGOs that have centered themselves in Palestine, in the US, beyond, that you know frame themselves as our liaisons um, despite the limits of their advocacy that we can see, you know, their self-interest in funding and maintaining these international law frameworks. And I think this is a question that we can, you know, imagine and discuss. What does this look like? You know, this is a big overhaul. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm most proud of in this piece and in general in moving forward is the importance of speaking truth you know, not to fit into these existing colonial frameworks, but really to imagine the world that we want. And this shouldn't be limited by, you know, the realities that states try to impose upon us, that settler colonialism has created, um, you know, the limits of international law, which we see the, you know, absolute emptiness of Zionism or quote unquote pragmatic thinking. We really need to focus on telling the truth, telling the history, talking about our expectations, which Banna beautifully outlined, um, which free us to imagine what we really deserve, which is decolonization and liberation. And I'll end it there. Thank you so much for having us. I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and want to like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on the screen.